Good morning. Welcome to Crossroads Community Church. It is a joy to get to gather together, and you're here. We have the thrill of getting to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, together. And whatever it is that brought you through this week, the challenges, the things you had to overcome, we get to be here together, look each other in the eye, and affirm our love for each other and our love for Christ. Just as we get started, let me remind you of a couple things that are coming up, some important events you can mark on your calendar. As you've noticed on Sundays at coming in, we have the Recycle for Missions that's been going on in the back corner of the parking lot. This is the last Sunday for that. So if you have a garage full of recyclables, you're on your own, all right? Or unless you can go get them and get back here really quick afterwards. But you can still recycle for missions on your own in that you can take everything to the Recycle Center off of Railroad Avenue, uh, not too far from Saugus Cafe, Drop it there and bring the money and drop it into the offering and we'll put it into the missions department. We'd love to have you continue to contribute that way. Second, I just want to mention to you something that's not on the list up here, but we have a ministry called Valor Hikes, which you may have seen this show up in the, in the loop and in different announcements. Let me just tell you what that is. Down in the valley, there's a home for women coming out of difficult situations called Hope Gardens. There's about 100 women that live there for this season in life as they're working through different challenges and then they move on. But there's also over 100 children that are there. And all the young girls that live there have great role models in the staff that run the center. But the boys no, don't necessarily have that. And so what some men in our church started is a ministry to take all those boys hiking. And did you know that every single hike magically ends at in and out <laughs> I don't know how that works, but it does. So if you'd like to be a part of this, what we need are men in our church, grab your son, Meet at Tasley Canyon Park at 8.15 on Saturday morning. So July 16th, Saturday morning. Go for a hike with the boys from Hope Gardens. Talk to them about Christ. Give them a role model. Help them understand what God is doing during the season in life. Be a positive encouragement in their life. Also, then, for single moms in our church, if you've got a young son, love to have him go on the hike, you can take him there as well. 8.15, Saturday morning at Tasley Canyon Park. A great ministry. Uh, next thing I want to mention to you is coming up very quickly here is our women's summer nights are continuing throughout the summer here on Monday, July 12th. Our own Lorene Mugadichian is going to be speaking on spiritual disciplines, a very important topic for all the gals to understand as she looks at how we grow in Christ by just the rhythms that God gives us to put into our life. So don't miss that. You can sign up online or at the registration card. Two more things. July 29th to 31st, we have our next gen camp. If you've got a kid between fourth and sixth grade, you do not want to miss this chance to wear them out. So you will sign up online or again in the lobby for our next gen camp. That's July 29th to 31st. And then last, as you make your summer plans and travel and everything else you intend to do, make sure you mark down August 11th and August 14th. Those two dates, that's our anniversary Sunday. And if that means anything to you, you know that means in and out, right? because we've got every truck that in and out ever made coming here to be able to take care of us. So you wanna make sure you have that marked on your calendar to be here August 11th, Thursday night, or the 14th. Well, stand with me if you would, and let's go to our Lord in prayer as we begin our worship this morning. Father, we gather together as your children. Uh, you have saved us, you've redeemed us, you bought us back, you've given us this incredible position of being called your own. Uh, the forgiveness of sins that's ours because of Christ's work on the cross the hope that we have in heaven to be with you one day. And Lord, until that day, we ask that what we sing from our lips now and as your word is taught, that all of it would be an act of praise and worship to you as you conform our lives, transforming us into your image. In your name, amen. Well, church, let's remind ourselves of the infinite love, the endless mercy of our Lord Jesus that was poured out for us on the cross, let's sing out the, the truth of John 3.16 this morning. Come on, we'll sing. Come on, all you weary, all you thirsty. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. This is what he offers us this morning. Come all ye sinners, come find his mercy. 
Come to the table, you will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Come on, God so loved. Yeah, for God so loved the world that he gave us. His one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. goodness of God I 
Reminded of your goodness in this moment. Uh, Lord, in that first song, just demonstrated through that gospel that you, out of your abundant, unmeasurable love for us, would send your son to take our sins upon him, to pay them in full at the cross, to be raised in the newness of life that we could live with you a new life, an eternal life that is in the splendor of being able to be in your presence. God, we long uh, to be in that presence fully. And we're so thankful, God, that uh, you've given us your church, that you've given us the Holy Spirit to get a glimpse of that, Lord. And God, we, um, we want to be living with thankful hearts, with grateful hearts, with hearts that understand that uh, it is not our life circumstances that gives us worth. It's not something that we've placed upon ourselves that gives us worth, Lord, but that our worth is found in you. And God, as we sing this next song that is all about that truth, that our security, our foundation, our peace, our satisfaction is in you and you alone, Lord, I pray that you would work on our hearts to understand that more fully and that you would commit our hearts to living in that truth. Thank you that our worth is in nothing else but you, Jesus. For you are worthy. You are the most worthy of all. Help us now, Lord. Do your work, Spirit, and we'll give you the glory. I pray this in your name, Jesus. See you. 
Good morning, Crossroads. Good morning. What a great, um, uh, talking to Greg about this Thursday, what a great hymn that is by Keith and Kristen Getty, and so thankful for their um, ministry and work of uh, still uh, arranging and writing um, just rich hymns, and uh, that is a, a great, a great anthem to sing as God's people. Uh, well, you guys came to church this morning? Yeah, yeah. I think you know, everybody, everybody's on vacation right now, but just think how much money you're saving by being here. You know, so be, be thankful you're here. Um, uh, we are uh, in this series, um, Hard Sayings of Jesus, uh, and the title of the series is, What Did He Just Say? And we have been dealing with these hard sayings of Jesus, which as I continue to study, I realize most of what Jesus said are hard sayings. Um, now, on Thursday nights, we have hard sayings and soft ice cream. So uh, join us on a Thursday night. Now, next year, next year, I'm going to switch it up. We're going to do the soft sayings of Jesus and hard ice cream on Thursday nights. Um, uh, but I'm beginning to realize there, there's not a lot of soft sayings of Jesus. He came, he came to uh, divide in so many ways, and he's been doing that with the gospel the last couple of weeks. And um, if you're here this morning and you don't, uh, you don't struggle with sin, you've actually reached perfection, uh, then I would tell you, you have no interest in the sermon this morning. And so uh, you can, you can kind of just tune out if you've been glorified and you're perfect and you don't sin anymore. Uh, and if that's what you really think, the person next to you really is frustrated with you. 
and um, um, maybe, maybe give ear to the sermon because we're going to talk real practical this morning. Uh, Jesus is going to, in many ways, crawl up in our grill in all kinds of ways about this issue of we need to take sin seriously and to stop sinning. And so he's going to remind us of that uh, uh, in the passage. We find ourselves back on the uh, Galilean hillside in the Sermon on the Mount is where our passage is found. And so if you love Jesus, grab your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And um, uh, in Matthew chapter 5 is the beginning of that Sermon on the Mount. I've given you some context uh, over the last couple weeks when we've been in it. Um, And so Jesus is preaching uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is uh, three chapters on the Sermon on the Mount. And he's talking about kingdom living. And where does kingdom living happen? Uh, Remember, he taught us how to pray. Remember, he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So wherever the will of God is being done, that's where the kingdom reigns. And so the Spirit of God is in you, and hopefully it reigns over you because you are uh, doing the will of God. And so he's talking to us about living out that kingdom ethic of God's will being done in our life, and he's going to talk about sin. And it's a topical sermon uh, that he preaches in Matthew chapter 5, and he has various topics, but let your eye fall to verse 27. And here's where he picks up this whole issue of sin, and he puts it in the context of lust and adultery, but the topic is sin. Notice what he says in verse 27. He says, you have heard uh, that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In fact, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body, a body, go into hell. Let's pray. Father, we uh, we hear those words. They're hard words. They're, well, in some ways we could say harsh words. Uh, They tend to grate against our own sin nature. And Father, May we, um, may we be moved by the Spirit of God to deal um, soberly and seriously uh, and even severely with uh, personal pet sins in our life. May we hear not only the, the lips of Jesus here, but may we hear his very heart to us. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. amen. The year before his accident, he had quit his job as an engineer with Intel. And he had quit his job to climb all of Colorado's 14ers. That's peaks over 14,000 feet. In May of 2003, he began canyoneering in Utah, navigating the narrow passages of the Blue John with a mixture of free climbing, daring jumps, and climbing with ropes. Aaron Ralston had been climbing the narrow canyons of Utah alone uh, when a dislodged boulder fell onto his right arm, trapping him against a rock. You see, he was negotiating a 10-foot drop in a three-foot-wide canyon, listening to his favorite band, the fish, when he dislodged a boulder that he thought was stable. He writes, he says, I go from being out on a lark in a beautiful place, just being so happy and carefree, to like, oh no, I, 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 I fell a few feet in slow motion, and I look up, and the boulder is coming, and I put my hands up to try to push myself away from it, and it collides and crushes my right hand. Here he was, entombed in the wilderness of the Blue John Canyon, carrying just a small rucksack with just a one liter of water, two burritos, and a few pieces of chunks of chocolate. And all of a sudden, Ralston was pinned in the canyon, his right hand and lower arm crushed by the 800-pound rock. And he writes, there was this stunned moment of what, what, what? He he laughs now. It was almost a comic. And the next second, the pain struck. He says, if you've ever crushed your finger in a door accidentally, and we have, he says, it's times a thousand. Having failed to tell anyone where he was going, he knew at that moment he would never, ever be found. Now, more on that later. Aaron Ralston, at that moment in time, was was pinned down by this 800-pound rock. Now, we've all been pinned down in our lives as followers of Christ, not by a boulder, but by the weight of temptation, where it corners us in. 
And when it does come crushing down on us, this boulder of temptation, it is in those moments that our options become very, very limited. And Jesus is going to say, you've already heard his words this morning. He's going to tell us that when you and I get uh, pinned down by temptation, we need to take some very drastic measures. You see, Jesus explains that battling sin here on earth, well, it'll probably create some sightless, handless people in heaven. And and there's there's a whole lot of plucking and cutting going on in this passage. So I think you and I need need to drill down on it to understand Jesus What do you actually mean, and are you serious about this eye-plucking and hand-cutting stuff? Now, some in church history have taken this literally, seriously and literally, and they've gone to extremes. One of our early church fathers that we are so blessed by his life uh, uh, is Origen. In fact, he was so convicted after, after reading this passage of his own sinfulness that he went and he had himself castrated. I read that that this this week, and I said, so, I think it's time to take a fresh look at this, because I'm not so sure that that's the option at least all of us guys want to go after. And so this morning, what does Jesus actually mean by by pluck your your eye out and cut your hand off? Let's see it with fresh eyes. Let's start again with a passage and just kind of dig, dig our way out of it. Notice what he says in verse 27. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, hard stop. What Jesus does right there is he's been doing this in chapter five. He does it six times in chapter five. And what he does six times is he makes this statement, you have heard it said, but I say to you. You have heard it said, but I say to you. And what he's referencing to the Hebrews of the day along that that, uh, uh, Galilean uh, uh, bank there is he's reminding them of Old Testament law. He says, you know the law, and you've heard this been said, but I say to you, and what Jesus does these six times in Matthew chapter 5 is he takes sin, he takes the issue, and he goes right to the heart. You see, the law, the law can only touch our externals. Do not, and make sure you do do this, but that's all externals. Remember, the heart is everything. We've been talking about this for three weeks now. And so what Jesus does is he takes Old Testament law, and he says, no, I'm going to take it back to where the law is supposed to point to, and that is your sinful heart. So he says, but you've heard it said, but I say. You've heard it said that adultery, you shall not commit adultery, but I say unto you, watch this, verse 27, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his what? In his what, church? Heart. He says the sin has already taken place there. He says, you've heard it said, and that's the law, but I want you to tell you something here. Jesus is explaining to us that violating the law is not just an external reality. Violating the law, Jesus is trying to communicate, is a heart issue. In fact, the issue is not the broken law. Jesus is trying to tell us we have a broken heart. Now, now he he says, "You you better take notice of this, and you better get serious about sin, because if you don't, and you end up becoming identified as the sin that you commit. You just live in your adultery, and that's who you are. He says, you be careful, because that can take you right to this place called, called hell. Now, he knows, uh, he knows uh, adultery is a big issue. In fact, in the Old Testament, adultery, if you committed adultery, it was uh, capital punishment. And the reason it was capital punishment is you had two people coming, image bearers coming together, becoming one flesh, bearing the image. And when there was adultery, you destroy that one image, that one flesh. And when the image of God is taken, that of a life of another person, capital punishment, you take their life, whoever committed that. When you, when you break that, that marriage covenant of that one flesh, you destroy the very image of God, and God says, man, that's going to take your life. So he, he's, he's talking to a group of people that understand adultery is a big issue, but he's driving to the issue of the heart, and he's talking about sin here. He's using adultery to talk about it, but he's talking about everyday sin. Notice he goes on, verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Now, if you're on that hillside, you're like, now, excuse me, what did he just say? If you're the 12, you're like, wow, man, we're kind of, that got, that got real serious real quick. 
you know, Jesus, we're just kind of getting started in ministry here. Let's get a crowd, so maybe not do the heavy stuff yet. But he goes on. He says, I want you to not only tear it out, I want you to throw it away. Verse 29, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into Gehenna. It's sort of that word hell. It's actually the, it's the Greek word Gehenna, and it actually is a physical location. Every listener on that hillside knew exactly what Gehenna was. Gehenna is a trash dump outside of Jerusalem. It's where they threw all of their, all of their dump. And, and not only that, but all of the criminals that were crucified on the cross by the Romans were thrown into this ash heap of dump out there. It was always on fire. It was always smoldering smoke billowing up from this place. Nobody wanted to be near it. Nobody wanted to go close to it. And it was a place of like anathema. In fact, it was Jesus. Remember, when his body was taken by a rich man and put into a tomb. Otherwise, his body would have been just thrown out there in the ash heap of Gehenna. So he says, I want you to understand something. There, there's this physical place in Gehenna, that, that dump out there, is actually very reminiscent of this place called hell. He goes on in verse 30, and he says, now, you may have an eye issue, but you also may have a hand issue. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that the whole body go into Gehenna. What's Jesus saying here? Jesus is basically saying this. We must wage a holy, hellish war on personal sin. Hear me, Crossroads. We must wage a holy, hellish war on personal sin. Why? Because Jesus understands the Father. He understands the Father because he's been with the Father for eternity past. And he says, God is holy. And and therefore, you must be holy. You must be perfect. And, And when you are less than that, that's called sin. You miss the mark of God. And when you do that, you got to understand that you are in complete, complete uh, disagreement, disalignment with God himself. And you stand under his condemnation. So he says, get serious about personal sin. In fact, notice what he says. He tells the people in verse 20 of Matthew 5. Look at it there. He says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> They must have went, what? The scribes and the Pharisees? And the scribes and the Pharisees are saying, we're not good enough? And everybody else is looking at scribes and Pharisees like, they're not good enough? And Jesus says, yeah, you have to be what? Perfect. You can't be kind of good like the scribes and Pharisees. You've got to be absolutely perfect. And therefore, you and I must wage this holy, hellish war against personal sin. Now, you've got to understand something. Jesus is using this idea of pluck it out and cut, cut it off. He's doing that as a metaphor about waging that war. He's not talking literally for us to pluck out our eyes and for us to cut off our, our, our arms because self-mutilation is actually violates Scripture. And so God, Jesus would never command something that is absolutely prohibited in Scripture. Self-mutilation is not uh, allowed. And and so what he does here, he says, I want you, I want you to take sin seriously. And he uses the extreme to make his point. And so what he says to us in these verses, and we just ran right through them, he gives to us these four, I don't want to say strategies, I want to say tactics to deal with sin. Um, If you have any issues with sin, meaning this, you've sinned in the last, let's give it the last um, seven days. If you've, if you've stumbled in your walk with Jesus in the last seven days, then these four tactics are mission-critical tactics. These are life-changing tactics that Jesus gives us. Why? Because everything is on the line. Everything's on the line. And you've got to understand what a tactic is. According to Webster, look at the screen. A tactic is an action or strategy carefully planned to achieve a specific end. An action or strategy carefully planned to achieve a very specific end. And so Jesus, what he does here, he builds into his, his sermon in this uh, passage four tactics for us to deal with personal sin. Number one, write this down. Tactic number one, Jesus reminds us in this passage that we need to safeguard your heart. Safeguard your heart. If we have any shot of uh, uh, battling a, a, a war against personal sin, it starts at the heart level. Notice verse 28. He says, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his, what's the word? Heart. Heart. Boom, he just tags the sin right to the heart. The transaction of sin here in the context of lust and adultery is a transaction of sin that happens in the heart. 
Notice that the lustful looking was caused by the heart. Just pick it apart with me. Everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent, that means they're lusting after a woman, notice what he says, has already. Did you catch that? Something has already happened before that look even starts, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Why? Because the heart is the central system of humanity. Remember the half-brother of Jesus? Wouldn't it be great to be the half-brother of Jesus? You know, I say, I don't don't know if Jesus had top bunk or bottom bunk. But James, you know, James, the half-brother, was probably always telling mom, Mary, Jesus hit me again. Mary's like, yeah, I don't think so. (laughs) Some of you in this room have had a perfect brother. James did. And James chapter 4, after he came to Christ, not to his brother, but he came to his Savior, his half-brother, Jesus Christ. In James chapter 4, verse 1, James says, Is it not that your passions are at war within you? The issue is within us. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse, verse 15, There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of the person are what defile him. It's what the heart generates. Guarding the heart in the Christian life is everything. Hear me, hear me on this, Christian. If you don't guard your heart, your heart will naturally drift to become hard, cold, barren, and dead. That's the natural drift in the Christian life. Now, that's why moralism can never save you because it just cleans up on the outside. It puts a nice veneer out there, but the heart can be desperately, desperately wicked. In fact, remember, you, 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 you Pharisees, you scribes, you hypocrites, you wash the outside of the cup, but what's on the inside of the cup? Filth, dirt, your heart. He, he, says, he, he says, you understand, this, this sin has already taken place in the heart. That's why Proverbs 4.23, put it to memory, Proverbs 4.23, above all else. When the scripture says above all else, guess what it means? Above all else. You mean above everything else in the, in the 66 books? Yeah, above all else, he says this, guard your heart, for from it the well springs of life flow. Why? If we don't protect our heart, we're dead. We're dead. We're dead before we ever start. Remember Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17, 9? He says, he says, my heart, the heart, the human heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately sick. And who can understand it? Let's think theologically here, friends. This is why we have to understand the theology is that none of us are born neutral. Our heart is, is desperately sick. I don't even know why I do what I do sometimes. The heart is, is desperately sick. It's desperately wicked. Uh, in fact, it was David who declared in Psalm 51 verse 5, he says this, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. I, I got two, two beautiful little, little grandsons, but they're, 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 pro- they're proving out this whole idea of original sin all the time. I mean, they're the most selfish little pigs ever. And they, they, you know, mom and dad haven't even had time to teach them to be selfish yet. But they just naturally come out that way. As Vody Bachman says, these little babies, they're vipers and diapers. That's what they are. See, that's why theology is important. When it comes to personal sin, we have to understand that we have to guard our hearts. We have to search our heart. We have to protect our heart. How do you do that? How do you do that, Pastor? Let me just tell you simply, it's not complicated. You gotta guard what comes in if you're concerned about what comes out. In other words, you must monitor what goes into your heart and mind. You know, how much, how, much, how much Fox News can you handle before your heart becomes sick? <laughs> That's what happens when you open up sermons, you know, to, to, to congregant participation. Not, not, well, not, yeah, you can't. Now you threw me off. I was on a roll. It, you got you to be, you be very, very careful about what comes in. You got to think very particularly about your eyes and your ears, what you see, what you listen to. You got to think about the people you hang with. Do they cause you to fight sin or give in to sin? You got to be very careful with the sources you listen to. You got to watch what you read. I call it the diet of the mind. We live in a world today that has um, article after article about what should go into the stomach. 
Very few people write about what should go into the heart. We have to be a diet of the mind. We've got to guard our heart. Tactic number two. Tactic number two. Slay. All God's people say slay. Slay Slay your temptations. Slay your temptations. What do I mean? Don't wait for your sins. Everybody says you need to slay sin. Uh, Loved ones, if you're slaying sin, it's too late because you sin. What you got to do, what Jesus is going to put before us is that we got to slay our temptations. If you want to battle sin at the sin level, (laughs) you're going to be toast. In other words, hey, I'm, I'm fine until I sin. Well, guess what? You're in trouble then. You gotta figure out how to stop the temptation before it turns into sin. That's why Jesus says in, in verse 29, he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, verse 30, if your right hand causes you to sin, that idea of a sin there, it's not the normal word for sin like nomos, anti-law. It's scandalizo. Scandalizo, we get scandalized in the English language. We get scandal from. In other words, he says this, if your right hand causes you to stumble, to be trapped in a snare, to be, to be baited, to be hooked, man, you need to slay that temptation. In other words, deal with the hand, deal with the eye, because those are the things that lead you into sin. Don't wait for sin to happen. Deal with the hook, deal with the bait. I'm not a fisherman, but we would, at family vacations, we're always in Wisconsin, so we would go uh, fishing at the lake with bass, and, and we'd do dock fishing, and there was always these big bass. I mean, huge, like, woo, big, huge bass. And, and I would drop my, my hook in there, and I'd put it right in front of that big bass, and, and that, that, that grandpa would just sit there and stare at it. Just sit there, not even flinch. I mean, this, and the worm was wiggling, and it's awesome. And then all of a sudden, this little small bass comes right and whoop. You pull him right on out. Grandpa's like, you see, son, that's why you don't bite. And the, the bass that figure that out, they got bigger and bigger and bigger. The bass that didn't figure that out, they were dinner. <laughs> you got to figure out at the bait level. You got to figure out your own personal sin at the hook level. Don't wait until you're on the hook. You gotta slay the hook because that's where the temptation is. Notice this, he says in verse 28, but I say to to you that everyone who looks at a woman, aren't you glad that he finished that sentence with lustful intent? If it was all, hey, anybody that looks at a woman has committed sin, we'd all be in trouble, men. We'd have to wear dark glasses. But he says he looks at a woman with lustful intent. That word look, circle it, it's a present participle. You know what a participle is? I used to think it was a half a simple. But a a participle, a participle remembers those words that end with I-N-G. In other words, this man is looking. This man is staring. It's not looking at at a beautiful woman and saying, man, she's, she's beautiful. This man is looking at this woman and is leering at this woman. Let me say it in vernacular today. He's a creeper. Okay, he's, he's taken a glance and he's turned it into a look, a leer. And he says, man, when that happens and you get to the leer part, Jesus says, you are dead. Yeah, you, there, you, let me tell you, you've already lost the battle. Check, please, uh, mill's over. And so what Jesus is saying is that you have to deal with it at the look level. You gotta deal with it at the bait level and you have to slay those temptations. Remember how I often say, man, you walk along the edge of the Grand Canyon long enough, guess what? You're going to fall in. So what do you have to do? Not go to the Grand Canyon? Well, maybe. Or maybe a more reasonable thing is step back 10, 15, 20 yards from the edge of the Grand Canyon. Enjoy the beauty, but stop walking along the edge. There's people, there's people that get caught up in sin, and then they explain to me their life, and it's like, well, for the last six months, guess what? You've been walking along the edge of the Grand Canyon. You can't figure out why you fell in. Why? Because you didn't slay, not your sin, your temptation. Now, you're looking at me funny, but I'm used to that at nine. Turn with me to the book of James. Talk about the half-brother of Jesus. Everybody turn to the book of James. It's a race, and I'm there. And I want you to see the life cycle of sin. There's a life cycle of sin. Remember Lion King Circle of Life? Was that right? Here's the life cycle of sin. Uh, and I want you to start in verse 13. Chapter 1, James chapter 1, verse 13. James writes, he says, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. 
Everybody got that? That's some good theology right there. He says, verse, uh, verse 14, here's the life cycle. But each person is tempted when he is lured, there we go, enticed by his own desire. Now, if you get enticed and you get lured, Jesus told us back in Matthew 5, you're already dead toast. You're, it's all, game over, check please. Notice what, what James says. What happens is you're lured and enticed by his own desire, verse 15, then desire when it has conceived, now we're getting a baby metaphor, when it's conceived gives birth to what? Sin. What, what do we have here? We have a little sinner, right? We have this little baby called sin. Oh, isn't, isn't he or she cute? No, they're not. It's sin. It's a violation of God's standard. His wrath comes pouring down on every sin. And what happens is if you, if you nurse that private pet temptation, it turns into a private pet sin. And notice this, notice this. And sin, when it is fully grown, when my kid gets to be a, a teenager, can drive, what is this? What is this baby? Well, it brings forth death. It brings forth death. You see, what happens here, turn back to Matthew chapter 5, what happens is, James tells us temptation enters the body through our senses, what we see, what we hear, what we taste, uh, what, 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 we, what we feel, but then in our heart, Jesus just told us, that's where the transaction of sin comes, and that's where the birth of a little pet sin is born, and it comes squirting out our life in some ugly fashion. And so Jesus says, don't wait for the sin, deal, deal with your temptation. And loved ones, every eye up here for a moment, do we not live in a present day aquarium of temptation? Do you understand it is everywhere these days? We, and, and so you have a choice. You go, well, the temptation's everywhere. I'm going to slay sin. So I, gotta get, I, gotta, I just got to remove myself from temptation. Well, you got to remove yourself from society. You got to go to Ohio and become Amish. And black doesn't look good on you, so don't do it. So what do I do? I live, I live in loved ones. We do. It's coming at us, whether we realize it or not. It's coming 24-7, 365. S temptation, let me, let me explain to you how temptation is in culture today. Temptation looks like this. And what happens is in culture today, we have... We have all kinds of temptation, the things that make us, oh, feel good, the things that make us rich. Oh, I want to I, I, I wanna feel, I want to self-medicate, I want to I deal with this. And what happens as a Christ follower, now stay with this temptation thing, I live, you and I live like this, right? Now, what we have to do is we have to say, no, I'm going to push this temptation out of the way. Because if I just continue to live this way, I, I'm going to take the bait. So I have, to, I have to work and discipline myself that I put this temptation away so I don't see it in front of me all the time. Otherwise, I take the bait. And what Jesus is saying here, and some of you are asking, who drank the beer? Get off that point. <laughs> You're missing the point. If I don't deal with that sin that's around me, let me just tell you, that flesh, that, that flesh in us, Romans 7, it comes, it comes raging back. And you know this. You're laughing with me because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because this is exactly what Jesus is talking about. You and I, some of you in this room, are about to fall into the Grand Canyon this week. And I'm just telling you, back up from the edge. Back up from the edge. Don't keep thinking, oh, I'll fight it on Thursday. You won't fight it on Thursday. If you're not willing to fight it on Sunday, you're not going to be willing to fight it on Thursday. So, uh, third tactic, third tactic is this, is uh, sacrifice even the good. Sacrifice even the good. Does Jesus say this? Yeah, he does. Notice what he says in verse 29 and 30. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Verse 30. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now, did Jesus just haphazardly use words? Did the gospel writer of Matthew just haphazardly pick words? Yes or no? The answer is no, church. Yes or no? No. Every word matters. Every word matters. He could have said, and if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. If your hand causes you to stumble, uh, cut it off. But he uses the right eye and the right hand. And there's a reason he does that. 
And not to offend the 10% of the people in this room that are left-handed, but in that culture, in that day, the right hand, being right dominant, was a, was a very cherished and valued position in life. It was honorable to be right-handed. We love, now, that, that was in that culture in that day. We love you left-handers. We just don't want to sit next to you. And, and the problem becomes... The problem becomes is that we're not willing sometimes to sacrifice what is precious and valued to us, is Jesus' point here. You must be willing to fight sin and give up things that are even good things, valuable things, perceived as, as, as this really dominant good trait. You gotta be willing to sacrifice those things. You and I, Loved ones, my heart, my heart wants to communicate this to you this morning. You and I must never lose the habit of sacrifice. Our Savior modeled sacrifice. And we must be willing to sacrifice even the good things. We have to train ourselves and our senses constantly to be able to, to, to say no to things. The, the master uh, spiritual discipline is that of saying no. And loved ones, hear me on this. No is a complete sentence. No. And, and, and the young adults here in this room, let me just tell you something. You want to live with the blessing of God and make much of this life? Let me just tell you, learn to discipline yourself. Learn to say no to some things. I, have a, I, I had a mentor years ago who told me, he, he says, I, I leave a portion of food on my plate every, every meal I have, and the reason I do it is just to discipline myself. Now, I, I didn't pick up that habit, but he, he, he did. <laughs> Why? Because he wanted the practice of saying no to himself. Listen, I love MacArthur on this. Listen to what he says right on the screen. He says this, why is, why is discipline important? Discipline teaches us to operate by principle rather than desire. Say no to our impulses, even the ones that are not inherently sinful, puts us in control of our appetites rather than vice versa. That's a good word right there. That's a good word. Sometimes the good things in our lives are not the safe things in our lives. Why? Because they lead us into temptation. They deliver us into sin. What are good things? What are good things? I don't know what they are in your life. This, this sermon application applies differently to every person in this room. But what are the good things? They're, well, they can be innocent things. Innocent people, innocent places, innocent practices, innocent programs, innocent pleasures. But you just go, man, I'm not going to put myself in that place, in that situation. It's like uh, in our family, we have a rule. You don't go grocery shopping when you're hungry. Right? Nothing, it's nothing against the grocery store when I'm hungry. It's, it's a me problem. And, and my kids love to go grocery shopping when dad was hungry because we bought the store. We bought everything. Why? But now I, I've matured and we learned, man, that's not, the grocery store's not bad. But it is bad to us when we're not in the right position for it. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And there's things already on your mind that God has brought to your mind. And they weren't brought to your mind by accident. Like, wow, where'd that come from? That's the spirit of God laying something on your heart from a, from a message from his word right now. You gotta slay the temptation. You gotta sacrifice even the good. And number four, number four, the last one. You gotta take severe measures. You still with me this morning? Yes. Some of you are still stuck on the beer can. Come on back. <laughs> you gotta take some severe measures. Here's the thrust of the passage. Here's the point of the passage. In verse 29, he says, what do you do with that eye that causes you to sin? Tear it out, throw it away. What do you do with that hand? Cut it off, throw it away. Take severe measures before it's too late. I think we all can relate to the lament of Augustine when he said this, I have learned to love you too late. I have learned to love you too late. Take severe measures now so that you don't lament with Augustine. Wage that holy hellish war by taking severe measures. We have to snap the spine of sin. We have to sever the impulses to sin in our life before we even get to the edge of the Grand Canyon. We gotta, we gotta remember that we gotta take the power of Christ in us and wage that 
that war against our own personal pet sins. What do we, what do, we do? We take steps that are needed. We, we, well, one step that's needed is blaming others. You know, we gotta take severe measures and accept responsibility ourselves. We don't wanna be like Eve. Hey, the devil made me do it. We don't wanna be like Adam. The woman you gave me made me do it. Taking severe measures starts with accepting your own personal responsibility to sever your own personal sin. And Jesus says, you better get radical about it. He got as radical as you can get. Pluck it out, cut it off. And he says, man, I want you, I want you to get radical about sin. And, and don't worry, people may think you're crazy. Like, oh, that's crazy. Yeah, you're right, it is crazy. But let me just tell you, it's worth it for me. This applies differently to every person in this room. But I know people, I know people who have given up the internet. They just don't have the internet coming into their house. They live on Little House on the Prairie. It's unbelievable. But they just go, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it for me. I know people who refuse to work with cash. They have a poor history with cash. They don't like the temptation of cash. And so they, they take jobs where they are never, ever around cash. Because they know that, that, that that's going to become a temptation to them. I know people have quit their job because they don't want any more business travel. They just go, it's worth it. You mean a career? Hello? Jesus says, cut the hand off. Yeah, get radical. I know people who have given up going to the beach. Just go, man, I just don't go to the beach. I got a, I got a friend who just doesn't go to the beach. I mean, it's sad. He doesn't enjoy the beach, but he says, it's just better I don't go to the beach. And I know people that have downsized their living because of the greed in their heart. And they said, man, if I, if I let this thing go and we keep upsizing, we keep growing, man, this thing is going to blossom out of control. I, I just, I, we just need to downsize. The world looks at these people, these friends of mine, and they say, you are absolutely nuts. And they say, yeah, but we may be nuts, but we're honoring Christ with some radical decisions in our life. For six days, for six days, Aaron Ralston kept himself alive with fierce self-control and a conviction that only logical thought could let him survive. He tells the story that the epiphany came to him, to this 27-year-old climber, when he realized how he could save his own life. And it came at a moment that he describes as an explosion of blind rage. He had been there. You know the story. You've seen the movie. He had ruled out the most drastic option that he could consider. That was suicide. But the next most drastic alternative came to him immediately in this rage. And he says, I, I begin to have this surreal conversation with myself. Aaron, you're going to have to cut off your arm. I don't want to cut off my arm. Dude, you're going to have to cut off your arm. I said to myself, man, are you thinking cool and collected here? Because that sounds extreme. That sounds like crazy talk. He says to himself, it's not crazy talk. Man, you have got to cut off your arm. Finally convincing himself of this, he himself, using a small knife from his cheap multi-tool kit, began to cut. It took him about an hour to hack away the flesh. As painful as it all was, the momentum of the euphoria was driving it, he says. So I kept cutting and cutting. He came against a problem as he cut away, and that was the actual bones in his arm. He realized that the blade was not going to be able to cut the bones, and so to deal with his bones, he knew that he had to use his body weight, and he explains, I had to fling or flung myself against the boulder to break the bones in my arm. That took a little bit more conversation but he actually did it. He says, for, frankly, looking back, it was rather easy. The snap of the bones was like, pow. It was a horrifying sound. But that horrifying sound to me was hope. It was hope. Because at that moment, it meant I was gonna live. And Aaron Ralston is 45 today because he did something radical. You'll see a picture of him on the screen. Aaron Ralston will always carry the mark of his radical decision. It almost echoes the words of Jesus. Bear the mark of radical decisions so that you might be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Amen? Amen. Father, we pray. We pray for ourselves.
We pray that the Spirit of God would give us the internal fortitude to discipline our lives to say no to things. Those things arrange, they're all over the board in this room. We all have our, we all have our bags packed with personal pet sins. Father, help us to think strategically. Help us to be shrewd as a serpents. Help us to think about temptation and slaying temptation of not even allowing us to get into the place where temptation is put before our eyes, but pushing away those things that we are surrounded by so that we are able to say no before it even becomes an overbearing temptation. Father, we do this not to earn our salvation, but because of our salvation. We do this to be conformed to the very image of your son, Jesus Christ. And we want to do that, Lord, because he was the one who knew how to please you. Father, we know we can't be perfect here on earth, but we want to be progressive in our salvation and sanctification. We want to make some progress towards that image. And so, Father, give us the victory this week. We pray this in Christ's name. Everybody said, amen. Amen. Did that make sense? Or do I have to go through this again? Um, Here's what we're going to do. We've got prayer counselors up front. We'd love to pray with you before you leave. So don't leave without being prayed for. Starting point, if you're new to our church, stop by starting point for one reason. We're just going to give you a gift and say thanks for worshiping with us. So if you're still fairly new or you've never been to starting point, why don't you do that today? Otherwise, Crossroads, you're loved by your Savior. You're loved by your pastor. Love you a ton. You're dismissed. Stay faithful.